Hey, welcome everyone to our conversations for a critical faith, uh, conversations after the sermon that uh, gives us an opportunity to dive into some of the things we talk about during the sermon. So uh, learn a little bit more, think a little bit more deeply, and uh, we'll see where it takes us. So uh, joining me is Nancy O'Brien. She's part of our online ministry, and she's been wonderful to lead these interviews every week. So uh, Nancy, welcome. Oh, good morning, Sue. I always enjoy this time together. And I'm also um, pleased to know that you took a few days for you last week. I took my own advice to stop, breathe, and trust that all would be okay if I took some time off. <laughs> good for you. And thank you for modeling the desired behavior. So I'm I'm excited to kind of dig into this topic as 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 we continue to be kind of in the Lent season. You have been inviting us to stop, breathe, and trust. And in your message today, as part of the sermon, um, I think what you're also inviting us to do is, you know, these, these challenges, right? Mm -hmm. these, these events that are kind of outside of us um, can possibly be turned into opportunities to practice and, and, and kind of you know, realize that we're kind of spiritual be beings in physical form and not let kind of all the worldly stuff, you know, hijack kind of who we really are. But can you just go into that? Why why do you think, you know, when those challenges are presented and we, we go into our fear mode, why, why do you think it's really, really important to like, ooh, stop, <laughs> get grounded, it, everything's okay? Well, I think we all have had those experiences where something happens, it's been unexpected often, and our, our fear mode kicks in, our worry mode kicks in, and it can just run away with us. I mean, it can just take over our lives uh, to the point that we aren't thinking clearly, that we aren't noticing what's around us, that we're writing stories that aren't true because we're anticipating what's going to come the next minute or the next day or the next week. And so we, we, we can easily just go down all those rabbit holes and never come back up. Uh, and I know people who do that, they live in constant worry. They live in constant fear and their whole world is, is about defending against something that probably won't happen, but, but their whole life is geared that way. Uh, and when you, you live that way, you forget that we aren't intended to live that way. Um, we worship a God who says, I am with you. We worship a God who says, there's an abundance of grace and mercy and goodness and resources out there for you. Uh, but when we live in that fear state or that worry state, we get blinded to that. Our, our brains literally cannot expand to the point of thinking of those things because our fear center just kind of takes over. So, yeah, how do we get out of that? Um, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we need somebody outside of us to say, just stop and take a breath. Um, but I think we can also create triggers for ourselves um, that help us remember to stop, breathe, and, and just trust that all will be okay. Um, and so uh, you know, I guess what are those triggers, I guess, is the next question, because somehow we have to knock ourselves out of that fear, fear place. And uh, I know some people have said, whenever I stop at a stoplight, I'm going to stop whatever I'm thinking about and just pause and notice what's mm -hmm. around me. Or they might set, uh, you know, I've, I've got a, a Garmin watch here and I can set reminders on it. And so they might set a reminder every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes, whatever, every hour, it'll vibrate. And just as a reminder to just, okay, whatever I'm in the middle of, stop, take a breath, notice what's around me, notice all the good that's there, notice the reality and not the fear. And so if we can practice those things, um, even when we aren't stuck in the fear mode, it becomes easier to practice them when fear kicks in and when worry kicks in. Mm -hmm. And then that grounds us. Mm -hmm. It grounds us in who we are in God's relation, in our relationship with God. It reminds us in who we, of who we are in our relationship with others. It reminds me, reminds us of who we are at our core. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why I think it's important because if we go down that fear path too far, mm -hmm. it consumes us. Mm -hmm. and that's not living. Well, you know, we still have these three brains, right? Um, that, that as mm -hmm. humans, we've had for a few million years, probably. Um, and the first brain that all sensory data touches is our amygdala, and that is the flight or flight. And so what's, I think is what is also interesting, we're the only species with a consciousness to aware, to, to bring awareness to our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So we can actually, what you're inviting us to do is like, just be in the moment, right? Yes. Like what you're worried about just probably hasn't even happened. <laughs> um, and, 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 and may not. <laughs> and, and get out of that flight and, and fight and flight mm -hmm. mode so you can make a more conscious choice. Exactly. Science has showed uh, that when we are stuck in that fight, flight, and freeze is the other piece that goes with yeah. that fight, flight, or freeze. When we're stuck mm -hmm. in that place, our neocortex does not function well. Mm -hmm. It is hard to make that leap from being in that place where our amygdala is taking over to our conscious thinking brain taking over. So thus, just building in these reminders that we practice no matter what, yeah. it becomes a little bit more second nature. And so it becomes a little easier then to practice mm -hmm. it when we are stuck in those other modes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for that 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 um, coaching and a little more depth. So I love one of your stories that you're sharing that somebody somebody gave up worry for Lent. So <laughs> so I I I think where you're heading in this message today is that this there's actually another spiritual practice you're inviting us to step into. Like like instead of like hanging on and hoarding and holding on to, right? Um, letting go and not just about the tangible, right? But the intangible, like what would happen if I gave away, gave up worry? Mm -hmm. So tell me, talk about this, this, this practice of maybe giving, you know, the tangible and the intangible. To kind yeah. Of step into worry. Yeah. And, and both are important. Um, the intangible you know, like giving up worry, giving up being afraid, uh, reminds us, when we make that conscious choice, it reminds us that we actually get to choose our own feelings. Now, I recognize that for people who've been through trauma, uh, people who might be dealing with PTSD and, you know, very traumatic events in their life, what I'm saying may not apply to them. Um, they're in a unique situation. But for those of us who who aren't being triggered by those things, we actually have more control over our feelings than we acknowledge. Um, you have kind of that first initial moment where the feeling kicks in. And I don't think we have any control over that. Science has not indicated that we can completely stop feeling. And we don't want to. Because sometimes we need to pay attention to those feelings. Um, but we have shown that once you notice what a feeling is, you can make a choice whether you want to own that or give it up. Yeah. It's just data. It's it's data. Exactly. And so if if you like living with that constant anxiety of worry, I guess go for it. <laughs> I don't. Um, so when I notice that, I stop, I breathe, and I start asking myself, what am I worried about? You know, what is it that's triggering me? And is there anything I can do about it? not the feeling, but is there anything I could do about what triggered it? Mm -hmm. And if so, do it, you know, mm -hmm. don't worry about it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if not, well, then what do you need to do? If, if you can't do anything about it, why are you spending your energy worrying about it? Notice it, be aware of it, but don't give it the power over your life that you give it when you, when you worry. So, uh, giving up those things that stop us from living fully in the moment and stop us from really living the full lives that we are intended to live, I think is is a good practice for Lent. Um, but I also talk in, in the sermon about giving up physical things, possessions, uh, not being so tied to our money in a culture where money is everything. Um, and partially that's because 
in the church, we tend to spiritualize things. Like, no, Jesus really didn't mean for you to give away all you have to the poor. You know, that's for somebody else, as long as you don't feel attached to it. You know, so we, we spiritualize all of the things Jesus says about our possessions and the role it has in our lives. And I think that we do a disservice. We start making excuses when we do that. Uh, and the reality is, and I, I, I say this in the sermon, that we all have way more that, than we need. I mean, I, I look at the house that I live in. It's, you know, when we moved to Lincoln, there weren't a lot of houses on the market uh, that, of the kind that we were looking for. And so we, we ended up buying a bigger house than we wanted. It's still a bigger house than we want. We've expanded to fill it. <laughs> Our, and, and I think just about everybody who's moved to a larger place has discovered that their stuff expands to fill the space available. But Linda and I both look around and say, we don't even want all this stuff and we have it. And so when you start having a lot of stuff and you start making that a focus, then that becomes what you protect. And that's because what you hoard. And when you're protecting and hoarding something like that, then, then you're living behind a wall that you've built for yourself and you're not really living free. So maybe there's something to be said for actually a discipline of giving up things things, physical things, uh, that would help us live a more free life. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of those who haven't heard the sermon, I'm just going to say, go listen to it because there's another story in there about somebody who's uh, spending a year living in a much smaller place than, than what they own mm -hmm. experience. And just, just go listen to that and, and see how that might resonate with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I have my own experience with that over the over the last really, I'll say, fifteen years. I've I've just I kept downsizing. Every three years, I just went smaller and smaller from from two homes and lots of stuff. I'm now down to a two bedroom apartment, and um, and and the apartment is above a liquor store and a grocery store. Even better for a pandemic. But what it really allowed me to do is is I was able to be of service of others. Like my son called and said, mom, I need you. I just got in my car and left because I my stuff was fine, right? He just closed the door. I didn't have to worry about lawn mowing or snow blowing or mm -hmm. anything. And, and even though when I moved into the apartment, I thought this is going to be great. I'll have the freedom to kind of travel to Prague and Paris and, you know, a few other places. But I ended up, you know, my my children needed me during the pandemic mm -hmm. and so did my my mother in lincoln and i'm like okay but if i would have still been tending to and caring for the larger home the more items that would have placed a a burden on me and since i released myself from that i could be fully present for the people in my life who needed me absolutely Absolutely. That's what a wonderful example of, of paring down and releasing that need to have all these things and to be defined by it. Uh, I think one of the, the biggest things that we get defined by is money. Uh, and again, I, I talk about this in the sermon too. Um, you know, there's this Christian uh, and Jewish practice of tithing, giving 10% of your income I'm going to say to kingdom work, not necessarily to the church. I mean, Linda and I don't give our full 10% to the church. We spread things out. Um, and partially because in, you know, back in, in uh, Old Testament times, the, the religious organization was the charity organization. It, you know, it, it was the food bank. It was the, the uh, elder care. It was all that stuff. And, you know, things have changed now. So, um, but... Um, a lot of people, you know, don't give 10%, um, which can sound like a lot. Ironically enough, typically those who make less give a larger percentage of their income to kingdom work than those who make more, which is an interesting observation there about the role money begins to play in our lives when we have more of it and what we appreciate when we have less of it. But um, one of the, the examples that I say in the sermon is that, you know, if you want to practice, just practice without any risk, 
not being so tied to how much you have, then, you know, figure out how much you're giving to charity right now. And the difference between that and 10%, put it in a bank account, open up a separate bank account, put it in there every month, you know, whatever, you know, 8%, 7%, you know, 9%, whatever that is of your income, put that in that bank account every month and don't touch it unless you have an, a, a true emergency. You've got a medical bill. You've, you've got a, you need to replace the roof on your house because it's leaking like a sim. You know, it was something like that. Um, otherwise, don't touch it. And see what that's been like for you when you reach the end of the year. Mm-hmm. It's no risk because the money is still in your bank account. And if you really, really need it, it's there. But if you found that you are able to live, live meaningful lives without that, then give that away at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And then start over again. I I think sometimes um, finding ways to practice with no risk is good. And then we discover that, oh, oh, this, I can do this, or this is the benefit I didn't anticipate from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. What a great idea. So my last question for you, my friend, Um, one of the messages in your sermon reminds me of a um, uh, uh, daily quote that cycles through from um, he, he's Chris Doris is his name and he's he's a mental health he's a mental toughness coach <laughs> and um, I've been getting his daily quotes now for like four years so you know they kind of cycle through you know at this point which is great oh we I need all the reminders but one of them is it's like when something happens right when when like oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. He's like, as quickly as you can, change your your inner talk to what miracle can I make out of this? Mm -hmm. Like instead of being kind of hijacked into that fear again, oh my goodness, the world is coming to an end, da-da-da-da-da. He's like, change change your your talk. What miracle can we make out of this? Exactly. I mean, that's that's the whole thing that we started talking about with is that we don't have to be hijacked by our thoughts and our feelings. We can choose how we want to live in this world. Mm-hmm. And and that led me to this notion that I would love your insight in of of life is always happening for us mm-hmm. rather than to us. What what. What do you make of, of that kind of shift, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I, just the, the language itself, when something's happen, happening to me, I'm a victim. When something's happening for me, I have an opportunity. And so again, it's a, as you say, it's a shift in the way you think, uh, in the way you think about the world. If if you're constantly going through the world as a victim, you're constantly saying, oh, poor me, all these things are happening to me and I have no control over it. Well, there may be some things, as I say, in, in some cert- situations that may be, there may be some truth to that. Um, but for the majority of time, that's a mentality that, that's not beneficial to us. So when we start that shift from saying things are happening for me, that opens up the idea of, okay, well, there's an opportunity here, a miracle, as you say. There's an opportunity here. What is that opportunity? So let me stop. Let's get back to our three, three, uh, three actions there. Let me, let me stop. Let me notice what's happening so I can think about, gosh, what are those opportunities here? What are the open doors? Uh, what are the doors that are closing that maybe should be closed so that I can go look, at, look for a new door? Uh, and then, and then trust that as you move forward with that opportunity, that God is with you, and that, and we have a God who says, all you know, through me, all things work together for good. Doesn't always seem in the moment sometimes, but in the end, what's the good we're working towards? What's the good God is working towards, and how do we want to be a part of that? So, so yeah, it's that shift from from whether we want to be a victim in the world to whether we want to be an actor a player, uh, a mover in the world. I love that. Oh, Sue, I always enjoy um, 
having these conversations with you and just diving in just a little deeper on the wonderful messages that you yeah. serve serve up every Sunday at First Presbyterian Church with you know what with, with your full heart. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, I enjoy doing it and um and I, I have to admit, I love working on the sermons because it's always, what is God saying to me now? And how is God challenging me? So thank you. This has been wonderful. And uh, everybody else, we will look forward to seeing you next week for our next conversation after the sermon. Thank you. Thanks for joining us at First Presbyterian Church where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. Find out more about us at fpclincoln.org.